Good morning, everyone. Um, Ron Gaish is chair of the City of Lawrence Affordable Housing Advisory Board. I'm calling uh, February meeting to order. I hope everyone's had a great weekend. Um, I might be at the front end of a cold, so I apologize to everyone whose hands I've already touched today. I've been trying to be fastidious about uh, not sharing my germs, but I'm pumped full of a lot of cold meds. And, uh, and, uh, Excellent. And, that, and, and that causes me to forget sometimes that I've still got a cold. And so if I've stuck my hand out to you uh, sometime in the last 24 hours, um, feel free to slap it the next time it comes your way. Um, <laughs> The, the first thing I'd like to do this morning is make a, a small change, a couple of small changes in our agenda. Uh, I'd like to have a couple of quick updates from staff uh, on the 23rd Tennessee Flats project and the uh, Bethel Estates 2 project uh, be moved before our agenda items C. Uh, actually, we'll do it before agenda item C2 because that information might be pertinent to the discussion we have on the Penn Street's law project. Um, uh, the chair would entertain a motion to make those <coughs> agenda changes. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Thank you. Uh, second thing that I'd like to do is uh, I have not yet seen, uh, because I printed my hard copies of uh, this material off last week before I left town and uh, didn't think to print off a new set this morning, I've not seen the Stoddard memo on the um, Penn Street Lost project. Uh, so before we have, af after the applicant uh, discusses, um, provides whatever conversation they want, uh, we'll ask Diane to summarize her memo uh, before we begin our uh, consideration of recommendations. And with that, let's turn to public comment. Do we have any members of the public who would like to make a comment before they have this one? Yes, sir. Please identify yourself. It's uh, Michael Davidson. I'm uh, at Delaware Street, also known as the Delaware Apartments. And I know during your consideration of the, the project that's going to be talked about today, you're going to talk about numbers, and you're going to talk about mix, and you're going to talk about all these kind of things. But some of the things that might be missing is, what's the experience of people living in the apartments currently there? So I live at, again, the Dulloft Apartments. I've been there since April of 2016. Uh, the experience has only been positive. The developer, the management team there, they are incredibly responsive. They're ahead of the curve on things. They have normal inspections. They change filters on a regular basis. They come in and do all the things that you, you want your developer and your management team to be involved in. So I just wanted to get that out, that I've been incredibly pleased by the, the work of the developer and the management team on, on the Delloft apartments. And the mix there is incredible. I am, guess, considered one of the senior citizens living there, even though I am actively employed. But there are uh, senior citizens who aren't working. There are people that are in fixed incomes. There are young children running up and down the hall on my, on my floor all the time. I'm right next to the, uh, the community room, and it's very actively used by some of the youngsters there. Uh, young families, college students, newly married people there. It's a great mix, and for somebody who grew up uh, in New York, in Levittown, which you may be familiar with, one of the first planned communities, it was no mix there. There was no mix of people, there was no mix of incomes. We were all the same uh, in that community, and it wasn't great as you look back at it. I mean, my parents thought they were doing the best, but to move into a community that was just totally white and had no mix wasn't great growing up experience for me. So I just wanted to share that. Again, uh, the place I live in is great, and the mix is great, and I think it creates what we want to create, a mix of people living in a community. We're not isolating an income level at one part of town and just segregating out there. So again, I just wanted to share that with you. Again, uh, you're going to talk numbers, you're going to talk all those things. I wanted to put a human face to it. So again, <coughs> thank you very much for your time, and that's all I have to say.
Thank you. Yes, other public comment? Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Max Couch. I'm an attorney in town, and I live immediately behind the proposed lofts process, uh, project. I live at 820 New Jersey. I'm also here on behalf of my mother-in-law, who's Nikki Proudfoot, and she owns properties at uh, 20, uh, eight, excuse me, eight, uh, 816 and 814 New Jersey. So those three houses, mine and, uh, and the two that uh, Ms. Proudfoot owns, uh, abut directly to the alley where the, uh, where the Penn Lofts uh, is proposed to go in. And, um, you know, the scope of what this board is um, dealing with is, is not necessarily um, the, the, broadest sco uh, the broadest scope, and so I'm going to try to narrow my comments to what I think might be relevant to, to, to this discussion. And, you know, I guess that, first of all, I live, I've lived in that house since 2011, owned it since 2016, so I have seen the uh, area sort of grow up around me. And there is, you know, I have no doubt about the, uh, about the um, quality of the, of the uh, rental experience there that that resident uh, shared. I, I have no doubt about that. That's not, that's not um, what I am, um, you know, basically the idea is I wish that we could call a spade a spade. Um, affordable housing, um, is that really what Penn Lofts is? Um, and what Penn Lofts is to me um, which I think is sort of what Nindell is also, which is a, uh, you know, an opportunity to have a more vibrant um, social, uh, uh, social experience. And I, I think that the, that the resident really highlighted that. You know, there is, uh, there is diversity there, and, uh, and, and that, there's no doubt that that's a positive. Um, I, uh, I just, you know, affordable housing, what, what are, and, and, and you all are in position to, to perhaps, uh, you know, I'll, I'll remain here and perhaps be educated. On, uh, on all this, and I, and I don't know uh, the details. I know that there is a, a federal grant that has been awarded, um, and, the, and, and that grant would not have been awarded but for a designation that this is affordable housing. I think that's going to be one of the points that the applicants make. Um, but, you know, the, what, what concerns me is calling a spade a spade. Um, what, what Penlofts is really going to be is what Nindell is, which is a really cool place to live. I mean, that's what it is. This is not going to do anything to solve, um, you know, if, if, the, if the homeless situation is, is uh, it was, certainly is a problem and, and how to deal with that. Um, this is not a solution for that. Um, my mother-in-law uh, rents um, one little one-bedroom places that are walkouts from those houses. And she currently has a single mother in one of those units, and she charges 450 a month for that single mother. And, you know, that's what I consider affordable housing. You know, something where a single mom can, who was in an abusive uh, situation in the home that she was in, would be able to come in and rent, um, you know, in a, in a livable and habitable place for $450 a month. Um, you know, the figures that were, that have been um, made available that I, 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 somehow I didn't write them down when I was at the PIRC meeting last week, but I, you know, $600 and $800 uh, per, you know, <coughs> rents are, are the sort of thing that I believe we're bandied about. Is that really affordable? Um, you know, the, uh, and then beyond that, and this is sort of getting a little far from what this committee is involved with, but if the plan here is to label it affordable housing in order to obtain tax breaks to combat urban blight, um, it doesn't seem to make sense to me that combating urban blight would be accomplished by building a building that is, uh, that, w w that would be paid off over 30 years. And, and as, the, and as uh, Tony indicated in the PARC meeting, you know, we all just hope to be alive in 30 years. Um, you know, it's, it's very difficult to see um, how a 30-year investment in a building that, you know, could itself become blight. Um, how is that then um, solving, solving a blight problem? And how is it really forty, uh, solving an affordable um, housing problem when the, you know, the issues that face the community I mean, basically what we'd be looking at is nicer, is nice units for young professionals um, to live in and, uh, and, and families and, 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 and that sort of thing. That's not going to deal with the uh, Lawrence Community Shelter issues that we face. Um, and then finally, at the meeting last week, there was a discussion about, the, about Section 8 and whether Section 8 would be um, used as a, as a means to um, have renters in the, uh, in the, in the lofts and, and indicated that that would be the case. Um, the information that was also provided um, last week was, though, that 
only a handful. I, my notes here say uh, four to five, and I can't remember if that's total in nine Dell and Polar. Oh, no, four to five each. So about 10 total of all the living units in the two existing uh, buildings that the developer has put together. Um, you know, a very small percentage of those are actually Section 8, you know, what I would consider to be real affordable housing. Um, so ultimately, I, I would just ask that this committee consider uh, what, what is it that is, that is being solved here? And is this a, is this a, a problem that needs a solution? Um, are the folks who actually end up living in places like Ninedale, do they need it for an affordable housing standpoint? Are they living there because it's a cool part of town? I mean, I, mean, I live there because it's a cool part of town, right? Uh, I like it. I like living in that neighborhood. Um, I, just, I just am hopeful that spades are spades and um, affordable housing truly is affordable. And regardless of what a government says about a grant, I think that the realities that are demonstrated by what my mother-in-law charges for a one-bedroom versus, and I consider that to be affordable. Is this truly affordable? Thank you. Thank you. Do we have other comments from the public? Yes, please come forward and identify yourself. Good morning. <coughs> My name is Sarah Taliaferro. I've been in conversation with the members of the Justice Matters Affordable Housing Steering Committee and will present to the Justice Matters Board later this week. I do want to make it clear today that my comments are informed by the ongoing work I do with others, but does not represent anyone other than myself at this time. I feel some urgency in sharing my perspectives on the Penn Lofts project. I have two key points that I want to make. First, I feel it's critically important in these early days of the dedicated public dollars for affordable housing through the trust fund that you protect the integrity of the process you currently have in place. I personally cannot endorse a decision to circumvent that public application process by both awarding funding without a request for proposals and competitive application process and then encumbering the affordable trust fund dollars that have not yet actually accrued. Second, Though this project has great merit and will serve some portion of the people in need who are not being served on the current housing market, I'm not yet convinced that it absolutely is the most perfect fit for affordable housing trust fund dollars. Uh, I do realize that at the PERC meeting last week, there was some additional information that I think you might not have heard, but it sounds as if this is a, a project that continues to evolve and so I'm trying to keep up with the, the changes. Uh, but at, I do know that, uh, or please consider that, trust fund dollars are not simply a slush fund that is available to make up gaps in funding on a project that has affordable housing components. Feasibility without the funding is an issue for any application received by this board. I personally have no way of analyzing whether or not the $550,000 that might be asked of this fund could be trimmed from this project's budget since I do not at the moment have a grasp of all the developers' fees or what price the developers are paying themselves for the land, for instance. I have no, I don't know one way or another. But the need to be considered through the lens of the trust fund dollars is that of the people who need to be housed who are zero to 60% of the area median income, and so that is the lens to look through, not the need of the developer. You are undertaking a process, a new process for Lawrence with this board and this trust fund. There are a complex number of factors that are in play here, and your process will have to be adaptive. You're already in conversation about perhaps creating some kind of a reserve fund so that you could respond to projects like this when they come to you. Uh, in, out of the funding cycle, but that isn't in place. So again, I would really stress to you to, we need a culture shift here where the community starts to understand that all of you around the table are the experts and who are showing up monthly for the conversations about this issue and to, to do more of a job of asking you what is really needed instead of explaining to you that they're bringing what you need. Uh, around, so there are people sitting around the table who are actually serving and actually have personal relationships 
through their work with people who are, have been homeless, are currently homeless, and are transitioning out of homelessness. <coughs> there are even are people around this table who have lived that experience. So you are the experts. You see the scope of the need and understand it. Because I listen to these conversations around the table, I know that the people throughout that zero to 60, the people who are getting stuck and not getting out of homelessness into housing need transitional housing and, and therefore vouchers will be involved. So to my mind, you need some written guarantee that some percentage of these houses are actually serving that zero to 30 and then that the rest of the houses vouchers can be used. I don't know how that affects the formula of needing a 60 an average of 60% AMI to be served by this project for the, the LIHTC uh, conditions, but I think there's some more math and some more calculus that needs to go on with this project and, and more guarantees. And last, I just want to bring up the issue of permanent affordability. This is another issue that you're grappling with. Uh, <coughs> In future, I think you're going to need to consider, are you able to encumber a certain percentage of a big project like this? 47 units with some flexibility about actually serving, you know, 75% of that was actually serving the people you most need to serve. This is a brilliant project. Could that be guaranteed? Is there a way to, at the end of 30 years, uh, ensure that some of those continue, or that percentage continues, is affordable. A lot of conversation to be had. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Do we have any other comments from the public? My name is Steve Ozark. I'm here today as a longtime advocate of people who are uh, just trying to survive every day. So uh, I'll be brief. Um, I want to, and I'm here to address this board because this is what I follow closely is your work here. And I think it's really important that we get the community and everyone to understand your charge towards affordable housing is different than the big picture. In my mm -hmm. mind, your charge was voted positively by the voters to say we will incur more taxes for you to solve affordable housing, to solve the issue. To me, that means that 30% AMI that we talk, that you all talk about so much. To me, that means permanent affordable stock, number one. The argument that in 30 years a house becomes blighted and worthless is fallow to me. My neighborhood is full of houses built in 1959. There's nothing blighted on our block on Schwarz Road. Um, the issue of, of kicking the can down a good long way to 30 years is still an issue of kicking the can. And we may not be here, but our children and our children's children will be here. And we're counting on 4,000 new units that we need by study of, of permanent affordable stock. And while I think this, this project that Mr. Kresnick and his people have created is a really good one for the community, I don't think it rests with this body to fund this. The reason being, in 30 years, that property, which we know is the most difficult thing from what I hear from the experts, is land. I paid as much for my house as it would cost to buy the land in 1993. That land will be gone in 30 years to, to uh, the public at market rates. So this body, it's not your responsibility to see this through, in my opinion. I think that's excellent, the amount of leverage. I believe it's $9.7 million on this $11.8 million project. That's to be lauded that, that Mr. Kresnick and his team have worked so hard to get a project that's going to work. But at 60% AMI, again, that doesn't fit your charge. Our charge is the people that cannot possibly get into a home without vouchers and without the people who serve on this board that do uh, social services for permanently affordable housing. So I ask you to consider what I'm saying wordily, uh, carefully, because I keep hearing that theme of 30 years is good. It's good to some degree, but it's not your charge in my my strong opinion. You're, we will be judged by taxpayers in 10 years when this ends and, and it comes up for a decision. What do we do about affordable housing? Well, as I've learned, it's not gonna be solved in 10 years. 
Are the voters going to vote for another tax increase? You can bet they're not if we don't have proof. What have you done? Everything else is really important. Services, supportive services, vouchers, all that's really important. But a voter's going to say, I gave my money to the government, and the people I talked to really doubt this is really going to be effective. It's hard to trust the government. They're going to say, how many units do you have? Oh, yeah, we've got this many, but in 20 years, t this many go away. So how many units do you have? That's going to be the, the bar by which this caring community is going to say, I'll vote again, or no, I won't. And where's the money going to come from then? Again, I, I applaud this project. I'm not here to dissuade anybody from making a good living, from anybody who does construction. I think we need to be fair and balanced. But I do think that this is a well-subsidized project, well thought out. Possibly the city seems very behind it from what the newspaper says. There could be a loan of $550,000. There could be some other thing for this portion of the $11.8 million to be found. I call on you to remember who we're serving here and to hold strong to permanent affordable housing. Thank you. Do we have other members of the public who'd like to make a comment? I'd like to thank each and every one of you for taking time from your busy lives to participate in our hearing this morning. Thank you very much. Let's move to item B on our agenda, and Chair would entertain a motion to approve the minutes from the January 13th meeting. I move to approve the minutes. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the minutes. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed, same sign. Thank you very much. Uh, agenda item C, receive our monthly financial report. Good morning. All right, so I wanted to start our uh, monthly update with um, a quick recap of uh, kind of where we project to end 2019. Um, I want to say that with the caveat of we um, still have not completed our financial audit, so some of these numbers will likely change, but this will give you a good idea of um, what we're looking at for the end of 2019. Um, so I think the highlight is really that our revenues came in $70,000 over what we initially anticipated. Um, and our expenditures currently um, are $450,000. We budgeted uh, just over a million. Uh, the one caveat I want to point out is that most of that unspent dollars are for projects that were awarded in 2019, but we did not actually encumber the funds in 2019. Um, so even though there's a large discrepancy there, $475,000 of that um, is directly related to uh, those projects that were awarded, but we did not encumber the funds. Uh, in 2019. Um, as it relates to 2020, uh, we have received January's um, sales tax revenue, um, and that came in at $78,000. You will also see uh, that we did receive that transfer, that $350,000 transfer from the general fund um, into um, our, our revenues for uh, the housing trust fund. So I wanted to kind of make note of that for you all um, so that you're aware that those dollars have been moved over into this fund. Um, on the expense side, there were still some things that uh, we have encumbered the funds for, um, for that first allocation that was done in 2019, but we have not yet paid those out, so that's what you're seeing here reflected in that $225,000. So those are dollars that will walk out the door later this year, um, and we have encumbered those funds. Um, and as a final reminder, uh, the budget for 2020 on the expense side is $1,275,000. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Any questions? Quick recap. Oh, thank you. All right. <clears throat> Discussion, and I'd like to call on representatives of the project. To, uh, I thought you wanted to do the update on 2310. Oh, I, I, I apologize. Yes, I did. I just looked at it and then moved on. Uh, if we could please have staff provide the uh, updates for D1 and D2, uh, respond to questions that have been asked previous meeting about the 23 Tennessee flats 
and the Bethel Estate Stage 2 project. Yes, I'd um, <clears throat> be happy to. Um, so both of these are in the process of working through uh, the details of putting them in an agreement that would then go back to the City Commission. What we did want to update you on is um, these projects as it relates to your prior discussions and particularly one of them that I think does relate to the item that you have on your agenda here are the Penn Street lofts. So the 23rd Street, uh, the, the 2310 Flats project, that was um, one of the ones that you recommended funding. Um, the, the original request, as a reminder, was 235000 which um, would have funded five units. And as you know, the funding, though, during the discussion with the availability was reduced to 125000 um, in the award that was provided to this project. So in our discussion with, um, with Porchlight Homes, they've indicated that with that amount of money, they would be able um, to commit to three affordable homeowner units within their development. So it wasn't quite clear in the meeting, and what we wanted to do at this point is bring that information back to the board um, for, for your information. If there's some reason of concern with regard to this board on that number, it would be good to voice that. Otherwise, our, our plan is that that's what we'll be bringing to the commission in an agreement. How large are each of those units? Bedrooms. Uh, Two bedrooms, you all recall. Three bedrooms. Uh, that number, that detail, I don't know off the top of my head. Pardon me? I, I'm not sure either. Well, for me, that's a critical metric. Yeah, I think because that's, the that's discussion at this board has focused on what's the amount of the subsidy per bed. And, and I've got great concerns if the numbers that have been shared previously with us um, suddenly go soft and upside down because it seems to be an issue that's critically important to, to uh, many of our advisory board members that there, that there be a range of what's an acceptable subsidy. Yeah, I could ask, D Danny, can you look that up and then um, maybe we could have an update later on in the meeting when we get that information. I just need to, we just need to double check that, um, that all the units were the same size that I don't recall off the same I, and I'm, my head. I mean, square footage would be one rep metric, but a most important metric would be the number of beds. The, the number of bedrooms. I spent the weekend in a room that was listed as sleeping five people, but trust me. It <laughs> <laughs> okay, please continue. So and the, the second item here is a quick update um, with regard to the Bethel Estates. Again, we're talking with Bethel Estates about the agreement that they have. Um, and there was a question that was posed at this meeting last month with regard to the affordability. And I think um, there was some confusion about whether Bethel Estates project would be permanent affordability or something less than permanent affordability. We did go back and review the record because I wanted to be completely clear about this. So there's a pretty good memo that outlines this. You'll recall that Bethel Estates came to you in two different application rounds. Um, and the confusion may be because during the first application round, there was some discussion about permanent affordability and a question that was asked of them, which they indicated they'd be willing to talk about. However, in the second round, the round that they were uh, approved for, um, they were very clear on their application and during questions in the meeting that it would be a 30-year affordability period. So I wanted to make sure that this board knew that, and again, that would be our intention is to place that number in the agreement. So the Bethel units are 30-year temporary affordable housing and not permanent affordable housing. Yeah, 30-year compliance and, period. And those are rental units, not ownership. Rental units, units correct. And... and and the 2310 flats, those are ownership units? Ownership units. And, and they stay permanently affordable how? Um, we, we are talking about a deed restriction, a permanent deed restriction, um, or some mechanism like that with them at this point. And again, we're, um, this, that particular agreement, we're working through our legal staff and the applicant 
about before we take it to the city commission, but that would be the, um, uh, the likely mechanism for the permanent affordability on that. Okay, and the permanent affordability matrix, uh, metric that has to be satisfied there is 60% of AMI or 30% of AMI? I mean, how, what, 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 what will be the determination of whether it has remained effectively affordable or not? On the porch light homes one? Yes. Um, let me see if Danny can also look at that. Okay. Um, there, so there's another question with okay. regard to porch light homes, if you can look up. Well, we did, we did find that um, they have indicated there's going to be, in the total project, nine units of three bedroom, um, three bedrooms, and then eight units of two bedrooms. They do not indicate which ones will be affordable, though. So. Uh, well, the city's agreement with them better stipulate, or I'll come in and oppose the agreement of the city commission meeting. This is a huge issue to not know how many beds are going to be in those units. If they give us three two bedroom units, no, uh, they give us three two bedroom units as opposed to two, you know, three bedroom units, then in, the math turns pretty significantly. And if the math is going to be important, then we need to have. Uh, a, a real complete understanding of what those numbers are before we move forward. Yeah, very important point. Um, and the, you know, you will find and you'll hear me say the devil is in the details with this, which is when we get to talking with the applicants about these projects and, and nailing down exactly what they're required for in compliance and when they get their funds, et cetera, we're trying to ensure that um, the project is delivering on what it said it was going to deliver on and that we're doing our very best to secure the city's money to make sure that the project occurs like it is supposed to. Diane, I know you can't verify worse because you're still working on the agreement, but um, that project has agreed with me, and, or I have agreed, that we will put those in trust so that my process of income verification and reselling those at a stewarded amount that will stay affordable permanently that has worked for since 2005 okay. will happen. Okay. Okay. So I, I, I want to give them credit for that because they are working with a, a, a method. I think the city and, and we are just trying to work on how do we say all those details in agreement. I'm, I'm um I'm gathering <coughs> with the complexity on these, this particular agreement, um, because there is a lot of, um, of, of we're, we're hoping to create a model that this developer or other developers might be able to duplicate, replicate with regard to these um, ownership units, but it's been an interesting conversation because there's a lot of new things that, that is a little bit different than, than a Bethel project or one of these um, uh, projects that's also com needs to comply with other regulations besides ours. So I'm hearing the concern about some of the details from this board. I think given that, my suggestion would be that we would just simply bring this agreement back to this board for its review um, before it goes to the city commission. I think that the 2310 uh, group needs to know that this is a substantial concern for us. Uh, our understanding when they brought the proposal to us was that we were going to have, I mean, that it would, there would be a, a large enough affordable housing component to it that it would be even worth them coming to us and for us to invest our dollars. And if that shifts, that's a substantial concern. I, I think, though, it, it, it is important to note that that it was not granted at the applicant's requested level. And so with that, there needs to be something that occurs. And again, these are some of the details that, and, and particularly with this one, since there's a variety, the concern about um, that, you know, what exact units are gonna be required to be affordable, and also the affordability mechanism. I just think with this, with this one, it would be wise to bring this back before this body before it goes to the city commission. With other ones in the past, it's more clear um, what it is that you all have recommended and, um, and has been vetted through this body that we felt a comfort level taking it to the city commission. But um, that may be an important one in this. 
Well, and it seems to suggest we need to have a method for if we give projects less than what they're requested, do we, what form do we use to reduce their commitment to affordable housing? And frankly, it could mean, in some cases, that it doesn't work any longer for the applicant. And so this, and this is some of the challenges of having those decisions at a meeting where you're, you know, you're, you're already invested several hours in trying to get the decision that you have arrived at. Um, but there may be a lot of implications that an applicant hasn't thought of if their funding is substantially cut. It may mean, in fact, that the project can't proceed. That's not what's happening in this case, but it did definitely raise the issue of, well, what, what does this mean with the number of units that I'm going to be required to, to commit to? Um, so that, that project is two-bedroom and three-bedroom units, mm -hmm. okay? Well, now I'm, I'm kind of dumbfounded by our matrix here that was prepared by staff last fall. It shows that for the original request, the original request was going to provide 17 bedrooms. That's what they say the, origi the original re request was going to provide 17 bedrooms. But if it was only going to be five units, the only way you get to 17 bedrooms is if you average three and a half bedrooms per unit. They don't have any four bedroom units. So the number was wrong. And the calculation on the per unit, per bedroom subsidy was incorrect. It's not the I, I would, in Yeah, I would have to go back and figure out how that number was arrived the, at. The project in its entirety is 17 units. And within those 17 units are the two and three bedroom. So. So when, well that makes the number, that makes the number of subsidy per unit even not relate to bedrooms at all. So we were comparing apples and oranges when we were comparing this unit to the Penn Street loss project and didn't realize it. We weren't even, we weren't even looking at a number that was represented the same metric. <clears throat> I agree with the comments from the public that in 10 years, the community will look back and ask if we've done a good job. And believe me, that is certainly our intention to do that. Yes. So, I'm, I, and uh, I'm none of us are going to the math apparently to understand what these numbers. There, are. there's an, an there is an enormous number of details on these agreements and the compliance. Um, I have not been involved in um, in this type of a program, but I have been involved in a similar program with that involved economic development cash in my career. And I can tell you, it is an enormous responsibility ongoing for the city to undertake these agreements and their compliance. As much as the putting together the agreement and going through the process on the front end is our ongoing obligation in perpetuity on the back end. So there's a lot of details with this. We want to make sure that we get it right as well. So again, that's why my preference is to bring this back to you um, um, especially given the the uh, the questions and concerns raised here. Do we need a motion then to do that, Ron, or is that just something we can agree to, to do that at the oh, next I meeting? Because Diane said it a few times. I, I plan to I'll, I plan to bring it back. Yes. Okay. Because I'd like to see that as well. Um, would there be an interest in in seeing the Bethel agreement with this board as well? I think so. I just have one question on the Bethel. They said they would talk to us about 30 years or about 30 minutes affordability. Did we have that conversation and is that just a flat out no at this point? It was, it, it was raised, in fact, during the meeting, and I will ask if, um, if my colleagues that also reviewed the tape from the meeting in November would confirm, but um, I believe that staff talked with them ahead of time. It wasn't me, it was um, Alyssa, I believe, had some of those conversations during the application period. Um, and then it, there was a question asked during the meeting about the affordability period, to which Bethel responded the 30 years in November. In the first funding round, they indicated that they would that we'd be willing. Right. Second one. 
second funding round, their application clearly stated 30. Nobody specifically asked them when you guys were making the decision. Oh, during the meeting. Okay. I take that. I... So it doesn't preclude us from asking the question. I agree we don't have maybe the right to ask the question, but I think it doesn't preclude us from asking. So I'm just asking that staff would ask that question and see if there's any chance or any movement that we could go permanent or have a portion of the project at a permanent level. You know, if that's 15 percent, 20 percent, whatever. If that's a possible, or we're too far down the road to even ask, bring it up. And, and I think that there was some discussion with staff <laughs> ahead, of the, discussion. ahead of the application even going in, but we can further clarify with that. Right. Um, Diane, I'm looking at the staff memo on the uh, update to Bethel Estates. I'm looking at the Did they tell us how, are they still doing 42 affordable units? Yes. Okay. And, and is that the number? of kitchens or the number of bedrooms? It's units. It's units. It's units. Mm -hmm. units. Yeah. Okay. And do we know if there are one or two bedrooms or three bedrooms? Um, I'm looking at healthy. <laughs> it's a mix. Um, okay. Anything from 1 to 41 to 21, 21 would be a mix. Can, can we find out what that is? I mean, the same question applies here that applies to 23 Tennessee. Uh, what <coughs> subsidy that they've received? Okay, Ron, I don't have that stuff with me. I did break that down before that whole evaluation and broke it down on a per bed basis. I don't have that stuff with me, but I know that's how I uh, look at that. And, and I guess my only thought process on that is. Um, That's one metric. We've made commitments to these mm -hmm. people, yeah. and and I'm not at all interested in revisiting that, it, unless something on their part dr drastically changed, not on whether all of a sudden we're counting bedrooms or we were counting people or we were counting units, because I don't like the idea of. Uh, Revetting everything unless they're asking us for a significant change. I think that's very fair. I didn't have any intention for us to second guess uh, our recommendations to the city commission, only to ensure that what we've recommended is what the city commission receives as an agreement. That would be staff's intention as well. The, the Bethel topic was 42 units and 70. I think so. Um, let's uh, turn our attention now to the Penn Street Lofts Project. And gentlemen, you may proceed. Um, good morning still, by 15 minutes. My name is uh, Tony Kresnick. I'm the CEO of Flint Hills Holdings Group. Um, and I'm going to go just a little bit off script because there were some really good comments made that I want to address, if nothing else, before I forget. So I'm, if it's okay, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to um, get off the, the slide for, for one minute. And a um, uh, lot of good comments uh, from, the, um, from the audience. And I'm here, obviously, only to speak on my own project. But, um, but there is definitely some overlap. Um, Diane used the term, you know, sometimes something doesn't work um, if and when a subsidy is, is tweaked. And, and that is not only the case uh, with Penn Street Lost Project here today, um, but, um, but the timing of this is nearing the end. These are 2020 uh, affordable housing tax credits. As you'll probably hear me say over and over again, the largest allocation Douglas County has ever received. From the state of Kansas's perspective, I believe it is the largest allocation for a mixed-use, mixed-income, 9% project ever, uh, ever funded. 
And so this is a, this is a resource that literally no other community in the state of Kansas um, from a mixed use, mixed income standpoint has ever received. Um, uh, in terms of, um, you know, the, the, um, the permanent affordability, which uh, has come up a lot, we've had several conversations, um, you know, with people in this room, uh, city staff and beyond. Um, we are willing to do 10% um, of the units uh, permanently affordable. Um, we just don't know how, so um, we, we don't know what the exit strategy is. You know, there's been conversation about, you know, what is affordable and, um, and, and what is not. What I can tell you is that this project, four years ago, maybe five years ago, received a resolution of support from, uh, from the city. We have submitted, resubmitted, resubmitted this project. Uh, we have co-authored every single aspect of it from a density standpoint, size, scope. The, the city wants more, not less. They want an element of market rate housing, just as every single qualified allocation plan, uh, which is a, a fancy term for an application that the states that we work in, there's four of them want. They want a blend. Um, I'm not saying that there are not extremely successful special need projects, set-aside projects, that only target 30% AMI or less, but that was not the desire uh, of this project, of KHRC, of the city of Lawrence. In fact, frankly, I don't believe that we would have received uh, the sort of support that we have neighborhood nor scored in the application process. So again, we'll get to, to that in a second, but this project intentionally uh, provided something for everybody, beginning at 30% AMI, going all the way up to 80 excuse me, including market rate units, and then, as everybody knows, a permanent job creation tool with the commercial space as well. I um, want to uh, go through some slides real quickly. Um, this property is uh, across the street from Lawrence Beer Company, the Cider Gallery, and Bon Bon. Um, and you can see a, a, a view of the property. This is facing westward. Um, just real quick overview, uh, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program is the most important resource for creating affordable housing in the United States. It subsidizes the acquisition, construction, and rehabilitation of rental housing for low and moderate income tenants uh, with an emphasis uh, in December of 2017, which enhanced the program not, not only from the amount of credits, but also allowing people to make 80% AMI or less while still qualifying for affordable housing. The reason that we uh, did that bipartisan uh, support for, for this language was because we have huge gaps of housing at all different income levels. Um, and what we have seen, and I've had to do dozens of times personally, is that if somebody makes too much money, let's just say, $5 too much, and they want to apply for that 60% area median income unit, we would have to say, no, sorry, we can't help you out. Um, and so that's why they took the approach of including 80% AMI in the affordable housing realm so that on, on average, your affordable housing units averaged 60% AMI or less. This uh, is, excuse me, yes. I'll, I'll try to keep questions to <clears throat> a minimum, but who do you mean when you say they? You mean Congress? They, did they change the policy? That's correct. Okay. That's correct. Specifically, they changed the language in Section 42 of the tax code. I hate the acronym LITEC, Low Income Housing Tax Credit. You'll always hear me refer to it as either the Affordable Housing Tax Credit or Section 42. Um, so anyway, you're exactly right. They made an amendment to enhance the program uh, uh, within Section 42 of the tax code. The Affordable Housing Tax Credit Program has supported the construction of roughly 110,000 uh, affordable rental units each year. There was a little dip in 2009, 2010, um, back when HERA uh, was going on, but, um, but roughly 110,000 units per year uh, and 2 million units since the inception. And as a reminder, this uh, Section 42 was passed during the Tax Reform Act of 1986 and it was implemented the following year. Um, familiar with the projects, the, the first and second phase project in the Warehouse Arts District, 
Nine-Dell lofts as well as the Polar lofts. Um, and now let's talk about Penn Street lofts. Penn Street lofts will consist 54 units, 47 of which are going to be affordable, ranging from 30% AMI to 80%. One, one unit, as with all of our projects, will be reserved for a homeless transitional unit. There will be seven live-work units, and then there will be roughly 4,600 square feet of commercial retail space for a tenant um, that uh, has not uh, yet been uh, decided upon. I wanted to make mention, as with my project, as well as all of um, my friendly competitors' projects, especially in states where you get points for uh, partnering with the local public housing authority, just because somebody has, uh, I'm making this up, but two units at 30% AMI, five units at 40% AMI, so on and so forth, does not mean that that is uh, the, the, the limitation for how deeply rent, how deeply skewed your rents can be. For an example, through our partnership with the public housing authority, 12 or 10 of our units, in addition, in one way of looking at it would be in addition to the ranges of AMI, since we accept uh, vouchers, uh, 10 of the units of the affordable housing units between Penn Street lofts and Nine Dell lofts uh, has, have voucher tenants. So if you want to think about it from that standpoint, that is 12.5% of our units uh, are helping out people uh, at an extremely low uh, income level. And that's, uh, again, I think that goes to speak about not only how many people these projects touch, but also the range of individuals living within these projects. Um, somebody made mention that these numbers are constantly changing and, and everything has been shifting, uh, shifting around. I guess from the standpoint of um, interest rates constantly change, and therefore, the amount of permanent debt somebody can take out changes accordingly to, depending upon their debt coverage ratios. Um, I guess that would be accurate. But <clears throat> from, uh, from the standpoint of what we're doing, the amount of resources we've been allocated from the state, uh, what we have been approved to build through HRC and ARC, this, this project is, uh, is the same today um, again, aside from outside, factors outside of our control than, than it has been when we approached this body the last time. And where, that, um, where those project costs are, are $11,880,107. And that is with the benefit of the, AR, the IRB from uh, the rebate of sales tax on materials, as well as a partial building permit uh, waiver included. Um, the sources of funds, as you've seen in your memo, uh, come from the sale of the affordable housing tax credits, the National Housing Trust Fund that has been awarded also through the Kansas Housing Resources Corporation. Um, the amount of funds that we're requesting from you today, a, de a deferred developer fee and loan, which represents over a third of the totality of the fee. Somebody asked that question earlier. And then $3.5 million of permanent debt <clears throat> which debatably is the most significant um, portion of this slide, and I'll get to the comparison on that here in a second. Um, so that's the, that was the cost to build it. Now the cost to maintain it. There's $580,200 of gross potential rent. Um, we have vacancy, annual operating expenses, annual debt service, which leaves $46,782 to go towards contingency, capital expenditures, loan payment, and then the return. Oversight and vetting has um, come up recently. I wanted to make mention of this. Um, for applications, uh, public incentives and AHAP funds, on the build side of things, obviously the Kansas Housing Resource Corporation has evolved. This project has National Housing Trust funds, which means that the Kansas Housing Resources Corporation and allocating HUD's money um, have to do their reporting on that level as well. Uh, public Housing Authority re uh, referral requirement, city staff review and recommendation, and the city of Lawrence third party review and recommendation. Somebody also mentioned today that a lot more needs to be dug into. This project has gone through the city's um, third party 
and it was recommended for full funding. This city has gone through Kansas Housing Resources Corporation. This uh, project has gone through the syndicator, all of their underwriting, multiple banks and their underwriting. So this is very unique in that regard that oversight um, by no means is few and far between. From an operational and rental oversight standpoint, uh, we have the annual third party compliance and recertification audits. We have syndication inspection. That is not only a annual physical inspection, it's also an inspection of the files and the, of the finances. We have the bank inspections. We have KHRC that is on site to do their annual physical needs inspection. We have third party property management and compliance. We have HUD and IRS oversight. Gentleman from the audience spoke about his um, experience at Nine Dell Lofts, and although we'd like to take 100% of the credit for that, even if we wanted to let things slip, we wouldn't be allowed to with all of the different bodies that constantly have eyes and ears on these projects. <clears throat> the intangible benefits, people in this room know these as well as I do, but um, you know, incorporating the live work units, we have extremely dynamic mix, we have the permanent job creation, we have the sales tax generation, which is not included in any numbers that PERC uh, received for the 4,600 square feet. We have uh, the affordable housing far exceeding policy standards. Um, again, of the housing units, 75% of these units are restricted to affordable housing. Uh, and then obviously we have an infill mixed use, mixed development project that co-authored with the city beginning four years ago truly does provide something for everyone. Um, I understand that, especially when you're dealing with the largest award, and when I say award, I'm talking about specifically the reservation of tax credits through KHRC, but, but I understand that these are big numbers, these are complicated numbers. And the second that I think I understand all of these numbers, Congress calls off and change something, and then I have to go relearn aspects of it. But from a comparison standpoint, I wanted to share with you as quickly as possible other similar projects that you are aware of, and then some of which you might not be aware of here in the state of Kansas, as well as our experience in Missouri and Iowa, where we're very active as well. So. Uh, again, we're here before you today looking for uh, support for this project in the amount of $550,000. Um, let's start with Polar Lofts. Polar Lofts received $1,557,000 uh, for contribution for parking and infrastructure costs. It also had the benefit of state and federal historic tax credits, what this project does not. Uh, it was 49 units and we were only able to take out $1,070,000 in permanent debt. So very, very similar in size. Uh, Polar Lofts, 10% market rate, not 25% market rate with the commercial, but we were only able to take out $1,070,000. And I believe that the third party report, as well as every banker or syndicators look at these numbers, um, would tell you that Penn Street Lofts, cannot take out any more debt than the $3.5 million that I've already committed to. And if anything, they would like to see that number be reduced, if at all possible, through, the, uh, through any construction or contingency savings. Not really relevant for, from a housing standpoint, but since we're talking about these projects, next door is the Cider Gallery, $924,000 grant for infrastructure costs, $109,000 for utility relocation. Nine Dell Lofts, 225,000 city grant for infrastructure costs. There was a 95% tax rebate for 15 years. In case anybody's wondering, well, gosh, why is there a 95% tax rebate for 15 years on all of these projects you're getting ready to mention? 15 years matches the compliance period that the syndicator adheres to, and they need to know, or at a minimum would, uh, would like to know, uh, exactly what their not only rent costs but operational expenses would be, hence the 15 years. Um, Nine Dell Lofts had 43 units. It could only support $1.8 million in permanent debt. Why could Nine Dell Lofts, being a little bit smaller than Polar, support a little bit more debt? It was absolutely brand new, and 20% of those units were market rate versus Polar Lofts only 10%. Um, Parsonian Hotel in Parsons, Kansas, we converted to affordable housing. 
uh, four years ago, 95% tax rebate for 15 years. I believe they waived uh, the full amount of the building permit fees. They contributed a, or a, a building uh, worth over $400,000 to the developer. That was a 35 unit project that can support zero dollars in permanent debt. I'll come back to that in a second. Fort Scott Lofts, the old Western building in Fort Scott, Kansas, right downtown, 95% tax rebate for 15 years, $900,000 for the 35 unit project, zero dollars of permanent debt. Schoolhouse Lofts, Baldwin City, Kansas, many of you are aware of that project, 95% tax rebate for 15 years. That building had just been occupied, perfect condition, uh, and we bought the property directly for the school, from the school board uh, for a subsidized rate. 30 unit development can only support $180,000 of permanent debt. Also um, under construction in Fort Scott, union loss, 95% tax rebate for 15 years, $400,000 local grant can support $0 in permanent debt. Well, how is it possible that the last four projects I've talked about can support zero or near, near zero dollars of permanent debt? And this brings me back to a, a conversation that we had at PERC. Um, there's different camps that want their housing to be 30% AMI. I had two people reach out to me and say we want it to be free, okay? Well, if to build a project, a multifamily project, um, costs roughly fifty-three dollars to $5,500 per year in operating expense and reserves, well, your break even on a project like that is $450 a month. If $450 per month, roughly, your break even from a net operating income standpoint, um, I, I, I'm, people in this room know that, I know that O2 well. At break even, you can support zero dollars of permanent debt. So in the future, if the city or the community or somebody asks myself or very other capable people in this room of doing a project that does not touch all of the realms and only has rents at 30% AMI or less, it's definitely possible. I don't know exactly how it would st score in the eyes of KHRC, but what I can tell you is a matter of fact, there wouldn't be a $550,000 request before you today. It'd be $4,050,000 because again, the project cannot support that level of permanent debt. And at that level, there's a very good possibility that not only would the incentive request before this body increase from $550,000 to $4,050,000, they might actually have to ask for a backstop from the operational end in addition to that. And so that's why, again, over the last four years, in an effort to try to provide something for everybody, helping people out on the low income level, on the moderate income level, providing something market rate and creating permanent job solution, that's why we came up with what we did here today. Um, I've got five other projects that I could rattle off. Um, I think I've made my point on that end. I'm happy to stay up here and field any questions. Uh, if not, I just wanted to end by saying um, I took the last meeting for granted. Um, I don't believe that I was clear as to um, how valuable of an award, the size, the scope, the involvement from the city from the very, very beginning. And I definitely did not drive home the fact that we did not have time to wait until the next round. These are 2020 affordable housing tax credits. Our investor... Uh, Redstone Equity, uh, who is extremely excited about this project, a project that will undoubtedly receive national recognition and put Lawrence on the map for how progressive we have become for affordable housing. They need to be admitted to this partnership in April. Okay, we are we we are behind the gun here from a timing standpoint. I don't believe I did a good enough job last time explaining that, so I wanted to make sure to reiterate that. Thank you. One quick question. Where does that April deadline come from? It comes from your Redstone Equity investor partner, but the deadline's driven by, by what metric? Is it a federal deadline, a state no, it, deadline? No, it is not. It investor is. investor has to know by this time or they move on with their money or 
what that, 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 that's right. They need to place their money, and from an IRR standpoint, it's done on a quarterly basis. I'm just going to assume that April is the uh, is the the first month of their quarter. But um, but every single term sheet that I think I've ever received has dates in there. And if and when things shift around, especially if you're getting ready to open up your building in the dead of the winter time, um, or in this town, you know, you got to think about college turn as well. Even though non-college students. The, the town still turns at the same time, but um, but but I'm I'm just going to assume, not speaking for them, that it's based upon when they need to place their money uh, from an IRR standpoint. Yeah, I don't know. Um, we have not received our draft of the LPA yet, but uh, but as you know, it's a it's a HUD program, which by default makes it 30 years, restricting those portion of the units at 30% of the AMI or less. And I'm I'm going to assume that it is done as a loan. I've seen it uh, done as uh, forgivable debt in other instances. At which point, if you don't have a credit enhancement company with lost carry forwards. It's essentially a grant anyway by default, right? And so um, on this project, we were able to ask the, uh, state of, the state of Kansas, I believe, for another $1.2 million in federal credits. Uh, we, were, we did not um, because, again, we wanted to maximize the amount of market rate and commercial space, which created excess basis. So um, to, to answer your question, I believe it will be classified as a grant, uh, and then the second thing that I would say that did come up through uh, Tom Jackson's uh, re uh, report and as to how to handle that that we're working with on city staff, um, we do have the excess basis, so our, our, uh, our light tech or our amount of credits would not be affected in either regard. Thank you. Just a very brief comment um, about process and about um, these LIHTC projects. My name is Patrick Watkins, and, and I'm an attorney downtown. Uh, and I'm working for Tony on this project. But if history is any indication of what you all can expect um, in terms of LIHTC projects that are going to be presenting themselves before this body, it's unlikely that you're going to see another project. You might see one or two in the next eight years. We've, we've known, we have a list. Uh, it's available on KHRC's website. but we. City of Lawrence has received three large LIHTC projects per decade. Um, we've been through them. We actually went and visited all of them uh, the other day. They're all available. They're all standing. Uh, it's, a, it's a good exercise to get familiar with what's out there. Um, but we fully expect that there will not be an application in 2020 for a large LIHTC project that you all will be able to consider with this next round of applications uh, and, and the next opportunity to give away these LIHTC, or I'm sorry, the AHEB trust funds. We know that 1.275 million is budgeted for allocation in 2020. If you were to look back at the last two funding cycles uh, that you all have went through uh, in June and December of 2019, and you were to reduce the amount of requests by what's uh, by the LIHTC projects that were included in that, the total amount requested in those two applications was 350,000 and 450,000. So if you have 1.275 to give away at the end of 2020, and the most applications that you received in 2019 for non LIHTC projects was several hundred thousand dollars less than that, I think it's an important consideration to take into account today. There will no doubt be great applications in 2020. There'll, be, there'll no, no doubt be uh, opportunities to fund a, a great deal of projects um, and, and hopefully some dynamic projects. Um, but uh, the, the Douglas County Housing Authority could, could potentially speak to this. Um, we know of no 2020 uh, applications uh, for LIHTC, and, and that's common. Uh, KHRC can't grant to Lawrence or Douglas County year after year these types of projects. So I would encourage you all to think dynamically and think creatively about whether or not this sort of opportunity is going to present itself. How are these funds going to be used in 2020? Will there be an excess? Will you have to give away funds to every applicant that applies? Um, or is it worth looking at the process a little differently? We know that 
Um, we've heard that you know it's helpful to set aside some of these funds for creative applications. We think that this type of project, and specifically Penn Street Lofts, is just that creative, dynamic project that deserves special attention. It deserves a special allocation. Uh, today, um, we're requesting that you recommend to the City Commission uh, that this project be funded. Uh, let's, let the City Commission determine how that happens. Um, but we know this project compares favorably with the other projects that you've seen in, in June and December. Uh, and now that a commitment has been made to make 10% permanently afford, affordable, we, th we think it compares not only favorable, favorably with the previous applications, but we know it's going to compare favorably with what you'll see in 2020. Uh, we think it's a perfectly appropriate recommendation to make. Um, and obviously, that if there's any questions, we'd be happy to, uh, to respond. Thank you. Questions? questions. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, I, I did a little math over the weekend. <laughs> and looking at this 60% AMI level, it looks to me like your uh, gross income annually is going to be between, I calculated 43,000, you put up 48, I think. Um, so my question is if instead of having 47 units at 60% AMI, could you do 18 to 20 at 30% and have the rest of the building at market rate? And then you would still meet that 60% AMI for the entire building. Does that get us to the same place or is that not really something that you can do? Because that would put us, that would give us a building, a mixed building with market rate and uh, affordable housing in the range that I think this body is interested in serving more of. I'm happy to answer that question, and I might have this wrong, but can somebody remind me what the definition of affordable housing in Lawrence is? It is 80% AMI or less. Is that correct? Okay. That's not what we do. Okay. No. For rental, we use a lower amount, but for, for home ownership, we use the 80. Is that correct? So it is different rental mm -hmm. and yeah. ownership. Are different and let me see where we might find that. What, what am I thinking of, Pat? Uh, I think, Britt, do you have that for the incentives? You guys have it in your incentive plan. In the, in, and, and, I, and I can answer that question while, um, while, while we're looking at this, but I believe that the requirement is 10% of the units for this body. Is that? You're talking about 10 Okay. Okay. I, I, I apologize, but, um, but, but to answer your question, no, it, uh, it would not work for a variety of reasons. One, the 60% AMI average or less, that is just for the affordable units. Market rate right. units are not part of that calculation. And so if we were to take, again, it's just the math that we talked okay. about before, but if we were to take our 30% units and just for speaking sake, say, hey, make them all 40 or make them all $400 per month, well, then again, just like you guys started off this by talking about 2310, it would be a deal where I would have to amend my application. I would come back here and I would ask this body for another $3 million or, or however the math would shake out. Um, the other thing that would happen, and by the way, none of this is possible because we already have our agreement from Kansas Housing Resources Corporation. Um, you know, we, we made commitments. They gave us a land use restriction agreement, which will be fine. But just let's, let's pretend that in the next round we do want to do a project like that. The reason why we were asked not to and why on a personal level I think it would be bad business for a 47-unit development um, on a mixed income approach is you would have to make your average, you would essentially have all units at 30% AMI, and then all of the rest of the units you would have at 80% AMI. And so the second, to use my analogy, that person got a raise and no longer makes $24,980, but they make $25,000, the answer is this. Need not apply unless you as somebody that makes 31% of AMI 
wants to pay like somebody that makes 82%, or I'm sorry, up to 80% AMI. You're leaving huge swaths of people out on the streets. And that's why we designed this project like this. 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, market rate, permanent job creation in addition to that. And Monty, she's not here, and it's not fair for me to speak for her, and I won't. But if she were here, I wouldn't be surprised to hear Edith express objection to concentrating that many 30% AMI folks in one space, as opposed to having a broader mix. 18 and 54. Well, you got too many. We, we would never build Edgewood again, right? We'd never put 130 units all in one place. But, I mean, the Housing Authority, we serve almost 70% of, of participants at that 30% of AMI. We'd never build that, but I mean. Talk about one in three. Yeah. And, and, and not an issue? Is, no. Okay. Is that too bad? Okay. No. And again, just as a reminder, guys, this, this co-authored by the city four years ago, submitted four different times, has already been submitted, it's already been approved. This is, you know, the, the, the program. But in addition to what is in the LURA, I, I just want to remind everybody one more time, we are partnering with the Public Housing Authority from a referral agreement. We accept vouchers in addition to these minimum set-asides. And in the case of Polar and Nine Dell Lofts, of the affordable units, today 12.5% uh, are accepting vouchers, which obviously go up to but also below the 30% AMI. And then one last thing uh, is, is a reminder, one unit on this project is set aside for a homeless transitional family on a first come first serve basis. I have a question on that exact statement that you made because in your presentation you, you referred to the number of vouchers that you accept. You count those as heard that you count those as your as your um, market rate housing that those, some of those are offered at with a voucher. But I heard you just now say of the affordable units, a certain percentage of those would be vouchers. I just wanted some clarification on that. And then would you be willing to state in this that a certain percentage of units, however it's defined, would be reserved for uh, working with the Housing Authority for vouchers? Um, I don't know from a, um, I might need Rebecca's help here in a second if I can't think of it. But I don't know from a fair housing standpoint if I could even if I wanted to, to, to answer your question. Um, but what we uh, but what we but what we do do is try to set up these. And by the way, every single project that I listed, these are these are projects that have rental ranges in them, all the way up to market rate. But what we do do is go out of our way to uh, provide something for everybody. And again, even in the state of Iowa, um, I can't remember on Missouri, but definitely Iowa, definitely Kansas, we get credit for market rate units, which is why we you know, need to have that nice range, not to mention in this case, need to support $3.5 million in but debt. When you say you get credit, you mean I'm sorry, you we, compete, we score points when, in the competitive When you compete for the project authorization, the tax credit authorization, you're rewarded, it's beneficial, it's perceived as being beneficial to have that mix. That, that, that is correct. And I'm, and I'm not trying to dodge your question, but I couldn't, I don't believe I could say, unless you have a voucher, you can't live here on this floor even if I wanted to. What I can tell you is that our third project in a row, and I here in Douglas County, or fourth, I guess, if you include Schoolhouse, um, and I believe every other one that we have done, we do partner with the Public Housing Authority, and when there's availability and somebody comes our way, I don't think we've ever turned anybody away. So although I can't really control how many people do or don't have vouchers, um, we're, we're all in on the program. And I think, again, 12.5%, uh, um, uh, you know, s s speaks, speaks pretty, pretty loudly. So. so just another clarification then. So if a market rate unit is open and somebody's qualified with a voucher, do you count that as a voucher unit availability as well? I believe so. And, and when you, when you worded the question the first time, it, it made me think that I wish Wygan Omega or third-party pr property management um, 
because they would have those Co company was here and they would have all of that data but I but I believe that the answer is yes specific specific to nine Dell offs and, and polar I, I believe the answer is yes but if, if you don't mind what's that look like like a permit to thousand dollars but someone just got yes yeah, so the market rate would be a thousand but that's about the voucher the awarded yeah. voucher so yeah. so the way that works is none of no, nobody holding a voucher is going to pay more than 30 percent of their income mm -hmm. yeah yeah and we have a payment standard and so a participant can can rent a market rate unit and they pay 30 percent of their income and we pay the remainder okay um so a lot of times, even when you have a set aside, and let's say you had 15 units and you set aside five to rent to somebody with, uh, you know, who's at 30% of AMI, well, you actually can be renting to more people at that income level if they have a voucher, because uh, uh, we can pay up to the voucher, the payment standard. So, so. it's conceivable that your 47, 47, 47 unit commitment for affordable housing that averages 60% AMI, whatever that number was, mm -hmm. your actual number of people that might fit the category of needing housing support that might be in your building might be more than 47 units because you might have two units that are at fair market, that are at market rate where you've got tenants with vouchers. Oh, except we have to be careful with that because our payment standard is set at 50% of the market. So it would depend on where his what, rent at, What the is. spread was. Yeah. Okay. So we won't okay. pay just anything and everything. Yeah. Let's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> just go with that. Ch Chairman Gacious, I, 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 don't, I, I don't want to go on the record necessarily agreeing with that because I don't have that data in front of me. That's fair. Um, yeah. uh, and, and, and furthermore, mm -hmm. uh, I would obviously need to reserve the right to protect the amount of net operating income that's necessary to support the astronomical amount of permanent debt being $3.5 million um, before I would ever take a loss uh, and, and have set myself up for uh, having a cash call with the bank. Uh, but, but, in, but in theory, I, I believe that could be correct. I, I just don't have the data in front of me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I want to say um, a couple of things because we keep getting referred to. <laughs> um, and so it's um, the Lawrence Douglas County Housing Authority receives a request from everybody who's putting an application in for tax credits um, that we will enter into a referral agreement with them to send people, to notify people who are holding vouchers that these are units that are available. So we do this with every project um, that, that uh, Tony's brought. We do it with... Uh, Wheatland, uh, Bethel Estates, we've done, we'll do it, I mean, we agree to do that and the, and we create a list and say, here are the affordable, we do it with you all. I mean, we create a list of, of all the affordable units and who will participate that way. Um, the other thing um, that's really important to know is that I've received no new requests, right? So the funding cycle is February. So whoever is out there in the community should be sending me a request for a referral if they're asking for tax credits. And I am aware of none. Um, so I can substantiate the statement that I'm not sure we will see another tax credit request in the next year or so. The, de the deadline was on Friday of last week. So I don't, uh, so I think that is also true that, um, all of a sudden we had sort of the feast or famine, right? I mean, like, we have all of these projects and I anticipate we probably will not have more um, because I haven't received a referral request and they get points in their application if I will sign a piece of paper and say, yes, I'll refer and, to you. And the, and the pipeline for assembling that project, I mean, it, Apparently it's, it's two or three or four years. At least, at least. I mean. Yeah, I mean, uh, they, they contact me every year. I redo it every year, that they, and, and it usually takes them two or three years to get high enough in the queue to get funded um, after they make a request. So.
uh, if I can stop you for just a moment, Christina, could, could I ask, are there any other questions of the uh, pr program, of, of the proposal uh, uh, representatives before, before we just start our open discussion? Okay. We've kind of been springing off of the questions, and in just a few moments, we'll, everyone will have a chance to review their notes. And, and any other questions right now for participants? I have a couple just. Uh, I appreciate the 352000 in deferred developer fees um, that are part of the project. Can you give me the total number? Because I looked on the application, but some of those have changed since the application of total developer fees that you guys are, are looking at? Um, yeah, we were awarded, I mean, it's, uh, I think if I'm remembering right, it, in the state of Kansas, it's $18,000 a door. Um, so yeah, it, uh, the, the total uh, development fee, overhead, general requirements and profit reimbursement uh, is uh, 972, um, again, three, Three hundred fifty-one, eight hundred and ten thousand dollars is deferred. This has been vetted and approved by not only KHRC but also the third-party consultant. And, and then your um, contingency amount on that has that changed? I, I, or are you? No, no things haven't have changed much. But I just want to be fair. I don't want to use an older number. Yeah. No. Now. On the, on the contingency number, we have contingency between hard costs and soft costs only at 8%. That was a comment that Redstone Equity made. They wanted to see the breakout, and I read that, and maybe Tom Jackson as well read that, is that, he wanted, that they wanted to reserve the right to increase that. Upon increasing that, understanding that this is a 9% deal, not a 4% deal, our deferred developer fee would go up further than that. I think that we're going to be okay there. Um, but, you know, again, the, the rule of thumb, paying back the deferred developer fee while still having it qualify for eligible basis is year, somewhere between year seven and year 10. Um, we have our deferred developer fee loan um, being paid just before the end of year seven. And so, again, between that, $3.5 million, um, I've never, you know, whether or not it's from a consulting standpoint, my time on the various boards, my experience at Flint, I've never heard of a project in the in the state of Kansas that has put that much skin in the game. So, and then just to, just so we don't confuse matters, um, when I talk about permanent developer fee, um, that is after the eight million thirty five thousand four hundred and sixty dollar construction per, uh, construction slash bridge loan has been paid down by these various sources of equity. Tony, I'm, I'm going to try to rephrase that more simply, okay. and if I'm incorrect, please clarify. So what you've done is you've taken approximately a third of the developer fee that the LIHTC system metric allows, and you've deferred it, and if the system's not, if the program's not cash flowing at year seven, then you don't get to bring any of that back out yet? Gone, gone forever. Uh, you're, you're exactly right. Now, I, I don't want to pretend that deferring a portion of the developer fee is not common. It is common. Um, I because have, it puts your skin in the game. Well, it, it, uh, it puts skin in the game, which really, from my standpoint, two things. These state housing agencies, if I were to apply and say, hey, now, granted, a big chunk of this developer fee does go for overhead, general requirements, the cost of running a business. And in this case, I've been working on this project for four or five years, right? So this is just a hang on for dear, at this point, this is just a hang on for dear life type of project from recouping those types of monies. But if you're to apply to a state housing agency, especially when you have a project that has a large amount of net operating income saying, hey, I'm not willing to defer any of my developer fee, you're really kind of thumbing your nose at them a little bit. So they want you to take out as much permanent debt as possible, which there's no question that we have, defer as much fee as possible, which there's no question that we have, and therefore ask them for less of their scarce resources so that there's money left over to do other projects. And that's exactly what we've done. Um, is it kind of a live example? 
if you all remember some of the data that I threw out there, between nine Dell lofts and polar lofts, okay, that is 92 units, okay? Almost double, not quite, but almost double the project that we're talking about here today. Those 92 units have less than $3 million of permanent debt on them. So 54 units, commercial space, $3.5 million of permanent debt. Polar, nine Dell offs, 92 units, less than $3 million of permanent debt. Just to explain how tight these projects are and why we started off this meeting by talking about um, once their funding was cut, they needed to reorganize some things and possibly provide less units. Polar and Nine Dell lofts, almost being twice the size as Penn Street lofts with less debt, we have been unable to do a cash flow distribution to pay down deferred developer fee, I believe in the last two years, maybe three. There's no, there's no cash flow in these deals. Right? And we can talk all day long, and I do, on various panels across the country about construction price, uh, different types of fees, interest rate, you know, reserve accounts that are required, but it's a very efficient market, and the banks and the syndicators, uh, they all underwrite these projects the same way. There's not room in these projects, mm -hmm. which is why um, you know, we came out of the gate so aggressive here. Okay, thank you. Any other final questions for participants? Okay. Let's begin um, with discussion and Christina. Thank you. I I wanted to have some I had some thoughts that I wrote down and I had a couple of other committee members chime in on those thoughts about the Penn Street Loft project. Um, about it being affordable and then the housing is great, but I'm concerned we are assuming that affordable means equitable and those are two different things and they're not the same thing. Um, if Lawrence's median household household income is 46,000, I think I looked on our, our uh, on the health equity report or the health equity report talks about the median income being for Lawrence Douglas County 54,370 uh, dollars. If that's our um, median income housing income a year, that means that the living units for this development would need to be um, affordable for 30 years to make folks pay roughly, I think you said $24,980 uh, a year. Uh, they'd have to make that much money a year to be, for that to be affordable. And that's reasonable and it seems great, but I wonder if the calculation is taking into account the reality that um, black and indigenous people of color folks make living under that 60% threshold. Um, for our Douglas County, the median income for indigenous, Asian, and black uh, are significantly worse, significantly lower than that 54,340. Uh, I think it's like 37,000 or 38,000 uh, for a year. So perhaps that's not affordable for people of color for black and indigenous communities uh, to afford. Um, even taking into a consideration that this is not Section 8 housing, um, it's still something to consider. Um, perhaps folks with kids or disabilities, no means of personal transportation, or the elderly would still struggle to afford the rent. Um, for example, let's see, um, there are things that we need to consider that, that make this truly affordable. Uh, for example, the warehouse district is still in a food desert. Where do folks trying to keep costs down go to get their food? They can't all eat at Bon Bon or um, the Lawrence Beer Company in Decade. Uh, based on the map of the project footprint, it looks like even the community garden at the northeast corner of Penn and 8th would be destroyed to make way for the building. Um, also, how confident can residents with children be that their neighborhood school would be around for their kids to attend. It was not too long ago, a few years ago, that New York Elementary was in danger of being shut down. Um, what kind of businesses would be rinsing the ground floor? I had the chance to go over, and I'm not too often over by KU, but over at the Student Union, they have uh, the buildings that they created. It's really cool apartments, somewhat similar to the Ninth Street lofts, but there's um, some uh, businesses there that aren't, aren't organic to Lawrence. I mean, there's a 1-800-Flowers there, uh, which is cool, but uh, you know, that's not 
you know, what we need to be considering to have businesses do with Lawrence, I would think that we wanted to know or wanted to have more developers and, and more businesses that are organic and local. Um, and as you know, the rent is not the only factor making housing more accessible to our marginalized community. Um, I wish that developers would start being held to a higher standard in terms of their impact on and collaboration with the surrounding community, moving with a more collaborative spirit rather than just asking for kickbacks from the city to get their projects done. Um, so we need to think about, I think, affordability. And I heard Sarah uh, speak about how um, project integrity and how it's not a developer's um, purpose. Our lens of purpose needs to be people, not a developer's. I've heard a lot of really great um, input coming from the community, and I just wanted to make sure that we're making it clear that our lens is always going to be an equitable, uh, and, and making the difference between affordable and equitable is really important to do, and that we continue to make those steps. Um, even if it's uh, April deadline, and I, hear, I also heard progressive, and that Lawrence is progressive, um, it depends on who you ask. <laughs> so it really kind of makes it our important, the issue important of affordable and um, a housing issue, development issue, uh, really important for us to consider continuing to move in the steps of equity. And that's, those are just my notes on that. I'd be happy to. That's okay. Before you go there, I'd like to, that, that was extremely well spoken. That was really and, and powerful. I, I would like to make one clarification because you used a word in there which I didn't agree with and I think that um, we are not offering kickbacks to developers and that I, I think that, that uh, that's a very loaded word and it is not in fact what this, what, what the city or this board is doing. Kickbacks is a, uh, it's an extremely negative presentation. It's not what we're doing. So, but but you were well spoken. You, you, that that was a really well reasoned uh, piece. Thank you, Diane. So a couple of comments. Um, I prepared a memo that's in your packet. Um, you may have had a chance to look at it, but in case you didn't, uh, I thought I might recap it. Um, a couple things I wanted to hit on is um, the need for funds related to this project, the merits of the project related to the goals of the of the board and the need. Uh, the affordability period, and then give you a few conclusions, and then to talk about the scope of this board with regard to the project for you. Um, so the need for funds, there is an attachment. There's, there was a lot of detail included in here, so a lot of reading. Um, there was a technical report, most of which has to do with the other incentives that are being requested, the economic development incentives, which will have gone through their their process of review, um, but, but there was a memo at the end of that packet from the National Development Council that did speak to the need that this project has from a gap perspective in terms of what the project needs to be successful. And the conclusion from NDC is that um, they need all the economic development assistance, including the 550,000 in order to be successful. So they've reviewed all the numbers, the appropriateness of the development fee, and all of that in reaching that conclusion. So I wanted to make sure that you saw that um, uh, because it was at the very end of that particular report. With regard to the merits of this particular project, um, one of the things I look at is the number of units that are that are created here that are affordable, which is a substantial number of units. Um, in looking at the um, the goals of the affordable housing um, board and the city, you know, we've been talking about creating a hundred new affordable rental units, and we're on pace to do that. We have a significant amount to go, though. Um, and as I look, anyway, at the short term, um, there's not a, another project that would create the number of units in the short term as this project would. This is a project that's situated where the developer is controlling the land currently. They have the leveraged funds that they've talked about that have already been awarded. Um, they're not out seeking those. In fact, they have to deliver these units <clears throat> in 2021 to be in compliance with those other awards. So hence the urgency of this request and it coming to you in a way that's outside of your typical funding cycle. Um, the, um, the applicant, as you know, has applied 
through this process the last two rounds. I don't think it was particularly clear the urgency of this project with regard to the last round of funding where the project ranked as your third highest. So you were able to fund <clears throat> or at least um, partially fund the top two projects that were identified in that last round. This would have been the third one had the funds been, um, have been available at that point. <clears throat> the affordability period um, has gotten a lot of discussion. So um, this project would have the 30-year affordability period, and I did want to make sure that that was clear. And I think I heard them say this morning that they, had, they would commit some percentage to uh, permanent affordability. Did I hear that properly? Yeah, they're now saying 10% of that. Yeah, so there is some component of it which goes beyond that 30-year. Yes, true. Um, and, and just a comment, I mean, I think that this is deserving of some greater discussion amongst this board, this issue of permanent affordability, which would be a really good topic. Um, but I think that there is no doubt that if given the choice between um, an affordable unit that is um, permanently affordable and a choice between a unit that is um, bound by a time restriction, that we would always go for the permanent affordable unit. And that may be something that's attainable with some of the nonprofits that are sitting around the table that have the mechanisms to do that, which I laud greatly. But it may be a great challenge as you look back at that BBC report, which she told us that we're going to have to use the private sector and the development community to leverage funds to get the number of units that we need to, to meet the needs outlined in that study. So I think that that's a consideration um, here. Um, I don't know that we have enough money to meet the needs that we have um, and, and require permanent affordability, or we would even be able to be successful in requiring permanent affordability across the board for any of these LIHTC programs. Most developers would probably just pass on that. They can't make it work. You, you can see with these numbers, as it is, they are barely able to make it work as what they're requesting. Um, so, so this project comes to you outside of your funding cycle. With your um, great attention to your process and to transparency, which is extremely important to this board, I know that's a difficult thing to have happen. But sometimes these projects, I would submit, don't come really in tidy packages. They, they come at odd angles sometimes, these kinds of opportunities. So that's why this is in front of you, you know, at this time. Um, how you need to balance that as a board against your goals is something for you all to discuss um, and, you know, ultimately as a policy matter of the commission. Um, and finally, I would leave you with the scope of this board as it relates to this, because there's a lot of issues. We've got um, this board going through its appropriate planning processes. Um, this particular request has gone through the Public Incentive Review Committee just last week with regard to the, <clears throat> the other incentive requests on this project. Your, um, your scope is looking at the Affordable Housing Trust Fund specifically, and then any affordable housing merits that you may see and be willing to pass on to the commission. So I just wanted to recap that for you in your discussion um, so that it was clear what you were focused on in your recommendation. Any questions for Diane? Thank you. Um, let's return to board discussion. Comments? Yeah, I, I have a comment. So <clears throat> I have been concerned at at the um, at the discussion about the LIHTC prop projects, and and so let me I'm gonna give you a little bit of a background, right? So the housing authority, we own 450 units that I can give you an address to go to. Every single one except 15 of those units. HUD sends us money every month um, to subsidize the rent for. Um, per, per unit I have occupied, I get money every month from the federal government to subsidize those units. For my public housing units, I also get a separate stream called capital fund 
to take care of the property. And we, and all of our property is reaching about 40 years, right? So Babcock's a little over 40 years old and so is Edgewood. We are having to replace all of the systems. So pretty soon, last year we replaced all the windows at Edgewood. You'll see us doing the roofs. We've done the roof at Babcock. We had to do the entire chiller system, right? It's a lot of money. It takes us years and years even with those subsidies to save up the money that is required to take care of these properties. That was an old program that was called the Public Housing Program. It, it no longer exists. I cannot build any more property the way we have built Edgewood and Babcock. The program that HUD has now to build affordable housing is the low income housing tax credit. That, and if, even if the housing authority is ever gonna build more property that way, that will be the vehicle I have to use to do it. Um, what I can tell you is, and, and I think Rebecca can speak to this, it's very expensive to, to build stuff, to buy land, to get land. It's very expensive. It would be very difficult for me to build a 47 unit property. I don't know how, other than a low income tax credit, how, how we, I could do it. And, um, and so I am worried that we were being too hard on the permanent affordability. Um, and that piece because what we know for sure is we need four to 5,000 units. We've set a goal to do 100. I mean, I, 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 can't, bring, I can't get 100, right? Um, and so I'm a little concerned that we're being too harsh with that um, and that we're not going to get to where the taxpayers said we want to go and where we all want to go. Um, what I can tell you is that I keep getting more vouchers, right? Um, I got a new allocation, 27 additional vouchers um, for non-elderly disabled, and I'm going to need somewhere for them to be able to use their voucher. Um, and we'll apply every year that I can get more vouchers. And so one of the other sides of this is I need places we all need places where people can use a voucher. So that is just a little bit more of the picture of what's, what it's like out there um, because I, I just think it's really important to understand. I, I can never build what, what we have because those programs no longer exist. And, and to your point, I'd like to add something to your point. So none of us, um, are allowed to, to uh, set aside for any particular um, race or uh, that type of thing, any units. But the way through, the, the proper way through the fair housing rubric to do that is marketing. And, and your comment raised um, sort of a thought in my mind is that we need to make sure as we go forward, we maybe have that as one of our requirements for applicants that we make sure they try to market to disenfranchised populations and, and other people. But, but nobody is allowed to set aside any units for anybody of any particular race or, or that type of thing. But that was not what I heard her saying. What I heard her saying is that uh, that demographic is not being addressed by the housing stock that's being created. And I think that marketing is correct and perhaps what that marketing might need to be is to developers and builders saying, here is a population which needs to be served. So the marketing is not from the developers, but from the community in general to say, we have populations that need attention that because of economics are not getting that. I mean, we, you know, it's how do you make money doing $300 a bedroom, you know, or however that all works. How do you do it? And so there needs to be some mechanism. I, your point was really well taken, and I don't know how we do that at this point. And perhaps that's a big discussion. Maybe we take that up at our retreat. But that piece of, uh, and it's, it, it is what 
what uh, I think Mr. Crouch addressed there, which had to do with, uh, maybe not, but how do we address that really, the, you know, below 30 AMI, the 20 AMI, how do we do that? It, and looking at it from our perspective as a realtor community, there are so many obstacles to figuring out how do we make those, how do we create suitable dwelling in that range? I don't have the answer, and I think that perhaps, I mean, that's, it's, I don't want to say it's beyond our scope, but it's certainly something that we should have a conversation around. Is how do we do that? So. Well, and I'm going to guess that they have to have a certain number fully handicap accessible. Five? Percent. Five percent. Yes, sir. Ed, if you could step to the mic, please. <clears throat> There's no displacement of any community garden. That's, that's a private garden for a for-profit developer that I allowed to use the land for free for the last three or four years. I just wanted to set the record straight on that end. All right, thank you. I, I also think that we would be remiss in not acknowledging that there are neighborhood concerns about the scope of this project. I think that, uh, uh, you know, the, the neighbors have concerns about its size. They have concerns about it. I mean, there's a lots of things that... Elna has addressed in their memo to us what Mr. Collison has addressed, what, uh, uh, um, you yeah, know, I, yeah, has, I mean, these are, these are people who have made the output to us, made the outreach and said, please take us into consideration. I think we've got to keep that in mind. Those are not, not, uh, not unviable input that we are getting there. I think that's true. I think you got to be careful that there's a public process through planning that really addresses mm -hmm. that. So I'm not, I mean, we need to obviously take it into consideration, but I think planning is really where that lands. Agree. Um, a couple other things. I think, uh, again, where I was trying to go earlier was can we get some guarantee of more units at a lower AMI level to address? I think everybody's concerns that um, our lower income folks are really where we need a lot more help. And that also addresses people that make that make less money. I get it. That's where, where we need that. So 60% for AMI isn't the same for every population. So by getting us lower AMI units, that helps address some of that. Um, there are things. I, I, I really appreciate the, the willingness to guarantee 10% of the permanently affordable units. I think that's a nice gesture. That's five units. I'd love to see that at a higher percentage if we could leverage that at maybe 20% or 30%. That would get us 10 or 15 units permanently affordable. Because then when this in 30 years when this does jump to market, they can probably service that many. Uh, they would probably have enough income to service the building with that many uh, units. Because that's always but, let, but let me comment on that. Then you're asking the market share units mm -hmm. to have to the subsidize. rates increased to subsidize these other units. And what you've done mm -hmm. is is you you've helped to elevate the price point of the market value units. Well the market is going to be the market. <laughs> oh no, you can't you can't you can't push you can't push burdens on some part of the market without the market responding, though. I, I mean, I just, I, I. Okay, so the whole <laughs> the whole thing goes to market at that point, then. Well, I, mean, I don't know. I don't. You know, we've got you we've got five un, we've got five units guaranteed. Right. At. at I'm just saying, I'd like to ask the, which ask if we could get that up. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm asking. Yeah. And that's a math problem for them. 10% is up from where we were right. a week ago. And so I, it's, a very, it's a gracious offer. And so as we move that. forward with the process, perhaps with other development, I mean, we can potentially cons keep talking to right. Tony about this, but the reality is that we're already 10% where we were zero. And as we put together our, and as we look at other proposals in the future, that might be an ask which we make as we go along. Yeah. I'd also like to state, uh, following up on what Shannon said, the number of landlords and 
property owners in our community were always needing more people willing to pay for vouchers. And there's never enough. Right. And so voucher in hand by folks, the folks we serve at Family Commons who are all on below the 30% AMI, voucher in hand, no place to go with it. So having landlords that accept vouchers is a big push that I think could be part of this committee. Um, but it's certainly got to be part of our dialogue wherever we are in the city, encouraging that, um, finding ways to make it easy to say yes as a landlord or a property owner for a voucher. Um, because that definitely gets people housed below the 30%. Other comments? I believe it's a great project. I believe we need 47 units. Um, I believe we cannot ignore 7 million in Levertine. I mean, that's, <laughs> you just can't. Um, and they're right that I don't have a tax credit credit project coming up, Shannon doesn't, and so all of that we cannot ignore. Um, what my concern is, is how do we make this very clear that this is a unique way or how do we fund that gap in a way that it's not, oh, you can come back to the process and we redo it, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I, I feel like most of us are agreeing that it's really hard to say no to this project, and if I've asked, deferred developer fees are pretty reasonable. They have their skin in the game, uh, contingency is. And now I will say, NDC does not look at every line item and say, oh, that all has to be, that's the expense. I mean, I think there's some little question on 4.6% of overall project cost is gonna break the deal. That's pretty hard to completely believe, but I know as a developer, we also don't know what's gonna happen that it could be way more than expensive than, than uh, estimated. I, I mean, there's a risk in that. It's partly why developers make money. Um, there are developer fees that they are going to make in, through the project. So we are giving, we're kind of protecting contingency and developer fees with this 550. Is it worth it? Probably, because we don't have 47 units next ready to go with the land. One other question I have is land cost. They have 500,000 in acquisition for the project. Is that what it cost to buy it? If it was, with a little increase or holding costs, I'm fine with that. But those are places where they can make additional money, which again, as for-profit developers, you have to make money. I'm not saying that's bad. I think when we're giving public funds, though, we have to be very aware of all of those factors. Um, and so, one way that in other projects of the city and Ahab and everyone has said, yes, this is a worthy project. We don't have the grant funds because we gave those away already through our process and the timing won't allow us. Is, is there infrastructure help in this project that the city can give? Um, or do we set money aside from this trust fund that is a loan program or that we set it aside in a way that we're starting this revolving fund or revolving allocation for unique circumstances like this. Yeah. I recall, I think it was you, Monty, that mentioned something in previous cities that you've researched right, that they our, do set aside. Yeah, they did set aside a certain amount every year to create a fund to be able to deal with these things out of. And then it's not like, well, if you don't get funded, you can come back yeah, and right. say your project yeah, is right. the best, because I'll be back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, I think in fairness to all applicants and to the integrity of the process, we have to be careful. Now, do we need some flexibility for good, for projects that are once in 10 years? Yes, I, I'm not saying no to that. So is there a way we can start that, and I think, a deferred loan fund of maybe if contingency can pay it back to Ahab, then we can get it back if contingency is good, if, if something is really over expense of, of projected overrun, then maybe it becomes a grant fund because 
the project provides 47 units of affordable housing. Um, there's ways that all entities and all funding sources have deadlines, have whether you can get it, and these are the terms. Um, and I think setting those is very fair. And, and I think that's part of what we will be working on in our retreat, if I'm not mistaken, is kind of looking at these protocols for going outside our conventional thing. I think our question at the table today is, do we have the ability to go outside our current protocols for this project? Because we've not figured, we don't have a mechanism right now for granting funds that we don't have or, and, and I'm, I, that, so I'm a little unclear on how we move forward if the, the, this project is, is to get our help. What do we do? What's the, what is the mechanism there? or the staff being able to figure out the funding mechanism if we if that's the recommendation this board comes with. I mean I went back and looked at the matrix and Bethel granted an average score of twenty four point four, twenty three came flat at twenty two point six and came off with twenty two. I mean like in my <laughs> thought process I'm like if we had had a million dollars we would have done it. We would have funded all of them, right? I am not willing to, to uh, I mean, we don't have the ability to fund anything, right? We have ability to recommend to the city commission. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, what we think they should fund or may want to fund. And, and I mean, I think 2310 is a little bit tricky there right um because we partially funded them and then and now we have this situation um but i'm kind of looking at it going you know i'm not sure i'm comfortable i mean i think like i'm very comfortable saying to the city commission if we'd had the money we'd have funded it am i really comfortable saying and we think you should fund it? Um, I don't know. Um, but but I would have recommended it to be funded if we'd had been sitting on the million. So what would your, what, why if we had had the funds at the time, we would have done it, where's your reservation about saying to the commission, this is a strong enough project that if we had had the ability, we would have funded. We don't have the ability. We'd like to go to you and say, if you have the ability to do it. Where's your reservation? It's, it's the partial funding of the ones we ranked ahead of. Mm. Right, because we would have fully funded number two first. I mean, that would have been, that would be Right, bad. I mean, if the money were I mean, there, we, may we have, would have done We that. may have done some other kind of thing, mm -hmm. but, but that would have been, you know, a, a, a question for, for Diane. <laughs> Diane, would it be possible, uh, what, what was our fund balance at the end of January? I think in the annual report we had 120,000 projected in there and revenues were a little bit higher than what we anticipated, so probably 150,000 and those are but unaudited. But that's the sales tax funds, that doesn't include the 350? That it does, okay. yeah, that's the whole, um, the affordable housing fund as a whole. It includes both the sales tax dollars and the general fund dollars because we transfer those into the affordable housing trust fund. It, it, so the balance is what? At the end of 2019. No, no, no. The, end, the end of January. End oh, of January. you're talking about, okay, the end of January, it was, I think, 200,000 was the difference between our, our revenues and so, so, the current so expenses. So funds. In January, January 1. We have funds encumbered from a prior allocation. Okay. So that's what you're seeing on the expense side of it. <clears throat> but this is where it gets a little tricky because you also have some fund balance from 2019 because we thought we were going to spend those dollars in 2019 and they haven't been, they haven't been spent yet. Okay. Okay. And I, th I think the big picture on the, the okay. funding is that um, if this body, if, if you want to recommend it, I think that the, um, the timing of an award with the applicant can be such that, the, that there's not a problem with cash. 
Um, they don't need the cash right now. They've indicated they, a need they to. Need a they need a commitment. Right, they need a commitment now. Um, so the cash flow is not an issue um, that this board should be concerned with. Well, I, I have two comments about this proposal <coughs> in the process that I'd like to make. Um, one is, and, and two or three people have already spoken to this. We've acknowledged that we can't begin to fully address our goals until we find ways to bring private sector money into the game. There's not enough public sector dollars to address the needs satisfactorily. She, she's no longer on this board, but I remember County Commissioner Thelman sitting in the seat that Diane's in right now in one of the first meetings I was here a little over two years ago, or right at two years ago, when, when the discussion was still pretty formative about what are we going to be doing with the sales tax revenues and do, are we also charged with coming forward with policy recommendations. And Commissioner Thelman was quick to say, yes, and you're also, you know, also part of the assignment is to come up with ways to raise other money to help address the issue. Well, in my view, one of the most impactful ways we can do that is find ways to leverage private sector dollars. And, and this has an impressive 11 to 1 or whatever, no, it was higher than that. It was a, an impressive leverage number. The dollars that we attract into the community, leveraged by our what's requested $550,000 um, uh, trust fund contribution, are significant. Um, it's the only private sector model that we have available for this size and type of a project. Um, until we come up with another effective model, and I'm excited to hear that there's discussions underway about how to create a mechanism so that 30-year affordable projects can be rolled in, uh, on purchase on ownership units, can be rolled into uh, some deed obligations going forward to keep them permanently affordable. I think that's great. And to your point, Christina, it becomes important then, what are the metrics that we're judging the affordability by? Because we want to be affordable to as many people as we possibly can. It'll be important to get those definitions correct. But, but right now, this is the game. If we're going to leverage federal tax credits for private sector investments in the community, this is what it looks like. And, and then the second, and it's, it's a, a, a related point, We've gotten some great comment from the public. And, and like you, I've gotten a lot of individual contacts from folks around the community offering me up suggestions and ideas, usually saying, don't do this or make sure you do that. We don't have a public sector not-for-profit or a for-profit model that satisfies all of the social equity issues that people want us to satisfy with our funding. It's not there yet. I don't know how we could put together a project exclusive of just enormous subsidies that would address the 30% AMI and below only. And the feds have confronted that issue and they've come up with a private sector model that encourages, gives additional points for multi-use. You get points for commercial. You get points for having some market value units. That's the model. Now, we can sit here in Lawrence and point to this and point to that. We don't like that policy decision they made. We don't like the way the equities break with this determination. We don't like that the developer gets a potential fee of 18000 a unit, which, by the way, is the same fee that every light tech developer gets, including the one we, re we approved. Same fee authorization. Um, you know, I, I, uh, until we come up with other solutions, this is the best available tool we have for leveraging private sector money in big projects. Um, it fits Plan 2040's priorities of infill. It fits the priority for density. Uh, it fits the priority for affordable housing. 
Uh, it's consistent with the neighborhood immediately across the street. And I'm very sympathetic to the argument that you make on the back side. But um, ask Nikki if she played rugby at Kansas State. Well, Does she admit to it? Ultimately, it, it is a laughing matter when you've got a, a big project that's going to you know, I, I understand. destroy the way of life that we've been doing. I appreciate your comment. Uh, I, I am very sympathetic and considerate of, of the public input and the neighborhood input we've received. But if not here, where else do we have an opportunity to put 47 units of affordable housing in? I don't know. It's, it's, it's not inconsistent with the property that's across the street and, and much of what's in the neighborhood to the east of it. What, what would people like to do? If we were to move forward with this as a recommendation to the city commission, how do we frame the financial element of it. In other words, how do we say, do we say we support and would recommend this moving forward with their request for dollars, and those dollars come from, I mean, how do we, how do we frame the source uh, of, of the? Great question. I have not talked to staff about this, but, but my recommendation, unless they told me that this was just flawed, would be that this language to the effect of the Affordable Housing Advisory Board um, supports the request from Penn Street Lofts for $550,000 of funding from uh, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, and we encourage the commission to make a commitment to do that, to be paid at a time when those unencumbered funds are available in the trust fund. And I don't know if that's I mean, maybe that's June or whenever it is. I don't know. I, I've not penciled out when that might be. Um, if the project, if the project were in front of us in November, and we had um, you know a million three available, and we had I don't know what we'll have in projects. Although I thought it was a very interesting point that if you back the LIHTC projects out, we, you know. You know, I, I'm hoping the pipeline fills up with other stuff, right? Okay? And I expect that it will, but I don't know if that will be this year or 20 months down the road. Mr. Chair, I apologize. Yeah. Seven. You're good. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Yeah. Yes. No, we're good. We're good. Thank you. <laughs> Would be an important question. Um, but how would folks like to proceed? I'd like to make a motion that this body uh, suggest to the City Commission that they move forward with the uh, Penn Street Lofts project, granting $550,000 from uh, Affordable Housing Trust Fund funds as soon as we have those unencumbered. Is there a second? Hesitation and concern rests in the, in the point that Rebecca brought out with the transparency in our, in our process. So if we can put something in there with that contingency in there for special projects, I think that would be wise. To add language to the motion for... Yeah, it sounds like a friendly amendment to refer to this as an exceptional... Uh, request and, and that we need to do our homework about how to how to handle special projects that come up that don't conveniently fit within the calendar. And, and I think that. I think we have that homework uh, a, a week from now in front of us or a little bit more because I'm I, I mean I think that that's something that in our retreat we really need to figure out because I'm not comfortable with you know with with just 
throwing it out, obviously I made the motion, but at the same time, it's, we, this is not normal. Does the maker of the motion accept that? Actually, well, frame we, of, I'd I, like to withdraw my motion so that we can continue the conversation. And, and I really would feel way more comfortable saying they came through the process, and if we had had sufficient funds, we would have approved this process. If you want to put the 550 in there, that's fine. We didn't have that ability at the time, but that we support this project, and if the commission wants to encumber that money, they can do the, that. The trust fund money. Correct, because we support this project. But, but um, I, I, it's the same kind of concern of the process, right? I'm like, very uncomfortable with you know, projects coming outside of the mm -hmm. normal funding stream and. Yeah, I agree. Um, was that a motion? Did I hear? <laughs> or? Yeah, I'll make that motion. That, okay. that basically that we are in support of this project and if we had had sufficient funds to allocate, we would have allocated the necessary funds for this project and, and you know, that we recommend that the city commission you know, take that under advisement, and if they want to allocate the funds um, when they are when available, um, we would other funds. right or other funds. We're in support of that. Is there a second for that motion? I would like it friendly, and then that we likely would have uh, uh, just, uh, just a just a process issue. I mean, we're we're, we're amending. We're amending amendments that aren't technically on the table. Until an amendment has a second, they really aren't a motion. Okay. 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 Now, so I would say that we would, this body would have likely approved that project. We didn't vote to approve that project. So that's just a tweet to her amendment. Yeah. Just an adverb. Likely. Just an adverb. Yeah. That's great. I Fine with me. Uh, other comments? Quick comment to the public. We have a period of time for public comment at the beginning of the meetings, and I have been very lax in previous meetings at allowing folks to comment at other times as well. Excuse me. Excuse me. But I have not allowed public comment once the board has started deliberations on a specific proposal in front of us. And so we will conclude those, uh, uh, that deliberation, and then I will ask, uh, and, and, well, and then we need to continue with what rem little remains of our agenda. But I'll stay as late as people would like uh, to receive public comment uh, when those other agenda items are completed. So we have a, a motion and a second on the table. Did we have a second? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I oh, thought you were the second. second. I thought you were the second. Ended. We, need to we had a motion a and a second, <laughs> and then we had Monty suggest adding likely. Right. And is there a second for that amendment? I'll second that. We have a second for that amendment. Any discussion? Hearing none, who's in favor of the amendment? Can we hear it again? Oh. Wait, he wants to add the word uh, likely. She said, that she said we would have approved the project. Yeah. And I okay. said we likely would have approved the project. So the first thing we're going to vote on is whether we accept Monty's amendment. That's right. Okay. That's right. That's right. That's right. So, so the, the question on the floor is to accept the amendment to the original proposal. Which is the addition of the word likely. Which is the addition of the word likely. <laughs> All clear? I mean, this All is clear. important. Good, yes, this is part of the process that we're talking about, and and so I'm I'm not I'm I'm not hard on the Roberts rules, but we we want our record to be straight. Gotcha. Any other comments on the amendment before us? All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Thank you. Mom, amendment passes. We're back then on the original motion made by Shannon and seconded by Tom. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the uh, 
recommendation to the city commission say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Um, the motion passes. Thank you all for a lot of really hard work. Um, okay, back to our agenda. The next item is agenda item C3, finalize February 21st as a date for a retreat and finalize retreat agenda. Um, we had a couple of folks with conflicts on the 21st. Any conflicts been resolved that we know of? And it would be the afternoon, by the way. Yeah, um, I was looking at that. Yeah, one, when, one to five. What are we talking about? <laughs> I got one to five. Is that one to five yeah. was the tentative date, and I think that you all just wanted to firm that up here at this meeting. Uh, did we? But uh, we had a couple of folks that thought they had conflicts. I thought sure. I did, and I did not. I and you do not it. now. That has cleared. Yes. So well, the, I have it in here as one to five. Okay. So the only person who was questionable was Patrick. Patrick. Yes. Yeah, Patrick. No, he is, um, well, I mean, gosh, having only one out of 13 absent it was as good as we did on our, <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of amazing, isn't it? I, 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 think, I think we lock in on, on the 21st, uh, 1 to 5, we're back here in this facility, uh, agenda draft, uh, I'm sorry, Tom? But on the agenda draft, I'd like, to, I'd like to add a topic, which is sure. how do we deal with anomalies? Yes, those outside the process. <laughs> yeah. That would be good. Yeah. Was Every, everyone, was pretty much fun. everyone's shaking their head yes. No, I think, I don't yeah. think yes. we can. Um, how, how do we deal with those that come up, any kind of anomaly, really? Mm -hmm. The stuff outside the normal flow. Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, how, how do you create a set aside or start to create a reserve fund or something? That ought to be part of, of what that, that answer looks like. Yeah. yeah. Good. There's lots of absence. They never know when their grant cycle is going to happen. Yeah. And Except what we don't want to see is an application every month. No. 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 Yeah. No, so you'd have to. Little, yeah. Well, and, and I don't know. I, you know I'm, I can't go back in time and completely uh, rethink this, the circumstance, but I don't know that they would have been back before us if they hadn't gone to the city, and the city asked us to take a second look. Right. Uh, I don't know that we're, we've done anything that creates any obligation for us to take a second look at just any applicant that comes forward and says, well, we were disappointed, we want you to look at us again. But this was a, a specific request that came to us from the city commission. I think that is an anomaly that we need from time to time to, and, yeah, and need a plan. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know that we need any kind of a, a motion to add to the agenda, but that's ma we'll make sure that's on the agenda. I'll add that to the third. Okay. Um, other new business uh, we've discussed one and two uh, update on the text amendment amendment 19006000 on the land development code permitting religious assembly units to create permanently affordable housing units on their properties. In the interest of time, let me just suggest that items three and four are both items that will be in process and will be coming back to you. It was just informative for you. All right. Read the staff summary. Good, good recommendation. I, I will say that oh. I'm getting an awful lot of interest saying, oh. with questions on that, so I'm anxious Very to good. hear the update. And, and, and what would be nice is if we could provide a packet of here's how to make it happen. So. And and the whole notion of having one of our neighborhood churches who might be willing to contribute land for a for a new build, you take the land cost out of a new build, mm -hmm. then you can start to target a lower AMI mm -hmm. because you got a big chunk of your upfront front cost that's gone. That. You know, we, we, you know, we, yeah. we can be encouraging um, our religious community help, to help us find ways to target our lower income need uh, participants. Okay, so three and four we'll hear more about in the future. Um, 
home buyer workshops. And thanks for the flyers, by the way. Those look pretty good. An update for F AC, FYI. FYI. Yeah. And, then, um, and then the New Horizons um, final quarterly, fourth quarter report mm -hmm. um, related to their project that is funded. Okay. So also just an FYI item for you. <sighs> Calendar retreat 21st, next meeting March 9th, and we'll have the home applications then. And I will not be able to make, make that meeting, I don't believe. Okay. Thank well, you. Well, and I won't be able to participate. Uh, none of us. The three. Okay, we'll, so we'll lose three, we'll four, table, yeah. uh, four of 18, yeah, I, that's I, I nine. Will you will, okay, so that'll be nine, because we need to get seven out of the remaining nine. Well, you can, you can attend the meeting for the purpose of establishing a quorum and then leave the room, because you're, oh. you're away from the table, but you're technically still here, and if, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, if you need us for that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll try and get confirmation so that you can know. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, public comment. Yes, sir. Uh, Sarah, come. Sarah. Thank you. And sorry, sometimes you do allow public comment after each item on the agenda before a vote, and so I yes, didn't sometimes. mean to disrespect your process. No disrespect taken at all. Okay. Um, so very quickly, it's possible the amendment you just or the the what you just voted on will cover this, but all I wanted to say was uh, in the city's strategic plan, it says that affordable housing available to all is one of the goals of strategic planning. The city is already putting $350,000 a year out of their capital improvement plan budget into the affordable housing trust fund. I know that in the past, although the process may have changed, so I might not be tracking, but in the past, if there was some kind of an emergency situation or a extenuating circumstance, something like the emerald ash borer or something like that, that the, the capital improvement funds or general funds might be reallocated to apply for that. So I'm curious, is there any mechanism that the city's contribution or a larger city contribution could be made to cover this so that technically it isn't the tax dollars that are covering the 550,000 that's being considered for, and, and is, is that something that could be recommended? And I don't know the answer, I'm not clear. All of the funds available to the trust fund are tax dollars. I, I understand that distinction. However, the, the voters voted specifically for dedicated funds to the affordable housing trust fund, and I'm simply saying that the city has the discretion to put in more or less or no capital improvement funding. Therefore, I'm curious that that goes in. It is not dedicated in perpetuity at, uh, or at any period of time beyond the one year that it's been allocated. And that's voted on each year in the capital improvement plan. So, so again, someone more knowledgeable than I would need to speak to that. But I'm wondering, could, could the city dedicate some contingency funds to cover that if rather than encumber the affordable housing trust fund per se to that so my go ahead the monty motion did allow for that because i think it did i, did, I think it did funds. so the motion allows for that whether they choose to do that or whether that's advocated for at the city level but but i so I personally might get up and kind of explain uh, the circumstances under which I could support that, I guess. But I'm just saying the, the language is, isn't specific, and I just have some qu curiosity questions. Um, that would allow you, I think, perhaps to honor your process. And then my second question is, somebody who got partial funding from you in the past or an, an applicant who didn't receive funding in one funding cycle, of course, can they come back in November and apply? Absolutely. So in other words, oh, could, could, if Penlofts then applied and went through the public process, which I, th I think that's one of the public objections to making an award in this way, then if they got that award in November, as long as the city was guaranteeing to cover it if, if they didn't win the award, then that would also 
honor your process while also covering a project which I, I think is a, an incredibly worthy one and my conversations with Mr. Kresnick and listening to the testimony lead me to believe that he could be one of many po private partners going forward to get us to our goals. So that, that was, those were my comments. Oh, and finally, if, if the city commission did encumber city money separate from the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, I still would recommend to them, if it were up to me, that 75% of those units accept vouchers, the affordable housing units, because if, if I'm tracking on the conversation, they, they can and that will still, it's the market rate of the unit and not the, what the individual is paying that, that will be, make them in compliance. That, that's a huge win. If, you, if it's in some kind of writing and you know, some formal co partnership to oversee you know, that. Sarah, you've touched on a point that I think there's been confusion on. There may and, be. And, and, and in visiting uh, outside of this meeting um, with uh, Patrick Watkins, uh, I was pursuing a, a line of questions similar to that. Okay. Here's my understanding. All 47 of the units are eligible for vouchers. Okay. But at any given point in time, there might be people in those units that aren't using vouchers. Understood. They, they don't hold themselves out and say, we're only available for people who hold vouchers. I understand the distinction. So, yeah. so I believe all 47 of the units are available okay. for voucher holders. Is that what you, I mean, okay. and, and I, I believe that is part of the federal requirement. Uh, the Okay. Well, thank you for clarifying. And, and that was my understanding, but again, I heard some things that sounded maybe in conflict, so I wasn't clear. Well, so, so I get that you're saying you couldn't guarantee, and I don't think that's what we're being asked. I think the public wants to know that that doesn't phase out over the 30 years. So just some, some clarification of the agreements no. in a public meeting that, that allow the public to understand. I, I think there, that's an outreach piece that nobody's in, in charge of right at the moment, but it's important. My, my impression is there's been lots of information shared about this project that's not consistent with the requirements that they've already obligated themselves to fulfill. And, and I, I understand and respect that. Still, the trust fund for your portion, any portions that you, uh, you know, pledge to this project or, or award to this project, for that, you can ask for more than LITEC asks for, as long as it doesn't conflict with the, those other agreements and, and conditions. That's all I'm, I'm saying. So we need some, the public would like some clarity, and I think that would be a big reassurance if the public understood that technically 100% of these, and in fact, they have agreements with, with organizations. I didn't, a, a month ago, understand that Family Promise families could actually be eligible for some of these units. So those are things that would be a selling points to, uh, for the public uh, perception or public approval, that's all. Good. Thank you. Great, great input. Yes, sir. Max Couch again. Um, on behalf of myself and Nikki Proudfoot, um, you know, I just there were, uh, you know, what I'm, uh, you know, when I'm thinking about um, how far the train is down the tracks on this one, you know, then I start to think about think to myself what can be done about this, and uh, you know, I just wanted to point out a couple things that were really striking about what happened here today. Um, essentially, there is a. Uh, uh, the quote from there, which was, uh, we've got eight million or, or whatever federal dollars, and, and we got to get those. We just, you know, hard to turn this down. You know, to what extent, if there were ever to be a legal challenge to the decision uh, that the city makes as far as um, uh, awarding these tax credits or, or any decision that it makes, you know, the way that the city would defend itself in such a lawsuit would be able to point to its processes and say that, well, our process is this, this, and this, and it was a reasonable process because we, this is how we do it and this is what we do every time. And that hasn't happened here, straight up. Um, this is a, uh, 
This right here is, uh, there is some sense of urgency that, that smacks of, um, of being beholden to a developer. Um, you know, there's what is wrong with, um, you, you know, and, and so for what I have gathered is that the, that the process that is ordinarily in place cannot work um, because the federal dollars will expire, um, you know, by the end of the month or so. Um, the developer's letter that I read there, um, you know, is, is, is nothing less than uh, communicating that fact. So, you know, when, when a court looks at the decision making here, um, will, you know, what will the testimony be? Uh, will it have been a, a reasonable and fair discussion, um, especially in light of the urgency that was clearly communicated to, to capture the dollars um, a, a, in addition to not being consistent with your process? Um, so, uh, you know, you've already voted. And there's not much I can say other than that, but, uh, you know, boy, I sure wish that it would, I would have a lot more faith and confidence in this situation. You, you talk about how you're going to retreat and you're going to deal with these issues next week. We'll see you just voted today. It's too late to solve those problems for this project. Thanks. I'll be real quick. So the, I believe that Mr. Kresnick offered 10% of the units permanently affordable. So does that account to 4.7 number or the 5.4 number? Do we know what that that number of permanently affordable is from this project? I will seek to get clarification from him in writing of that um, for the rest of the process. But I heard 10%, which would be, I think, 4.7 based on the affordable units. But we will have him make sure to put that in writing. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Seeing none, any other comments from the board? Our meeting's adjourned. Thank you all. You were right. It was a long meeting. Yeah.